Pick out your Bibles. We're looking at chapter 47 of the book of Genesis tonight. Um, we looked at last week, you know, that uh, Joseph finally revealed himself to his family. And because of that revelation, uh, they're basically saved and they're able to now come down and live with him there in Egypt. And uh, Joseph is going to take care of their every need. He's said that to them and he's kind of set it up already. He's told Pharaoh, um, you know, my family's here. And, and so Pharaoh is now going to bless them by saying, yes, you can go down and live in Goshen. But also what we're going to see tonight is Jacob, an old, old man at this point, 137, 130 years old. Uh, he is going to bless the Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at this time. And Jacob's going to bless him. So it's interesting. Uh, and we can just start reading there in verse 1 of chapter 47. It says, Then Joseph went and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brothers, their flocks and their herds and all that they possess, have come from the land of Canaan. And indeed, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took five men from among his brothers and presented them to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to his brothers, What is your occupation? And they said to Pharaoh, Your servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. And they said to Pharaoh, We have come to dwell in the land because your servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is severe in the land of Canaan. Now therefore, please let your servants dwell in the land of Goshen. Then Pharaoh spoke to Joseph, saying, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Have your father and brothers dwell in the best of the land. Let them dwell in the land of Goshen. And if you know any competent men among them, then make them chief herdsmen over my livestock. Then Joseph brought in uh, his father Jacob and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, How old are you? And uh, Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days in the, of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days and ye- of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. So Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for your word. And again, we ask that your spirit would guide us and lead us and help us to understand these things in a new and fresh way. Help us to apply them again in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, um, you know, the story is pretty basic tonight. Uh, You have the family coming down and, and this wonderful kind of situation where Pharaoh is is... He's excited about it. He's excited for his prime minister, Joseph, and and thinks it's a great thing that he's finally being reunited with his family and thinks so much of Joseph that he's willing to give his family the best of the land, the land of Goshen. And so um, that's what you see there. It's interesting, though, the blessing. Jacob blesses the Pharaoh. Well, the first thing that we see there is there is, is a sojourning. Now, the New King James doesn't say it as powerfully as uh, the old King James does. But the word there in, in verse 4, we have come to dwell in the land. In the old King James, it says we have come to sojourn in the land. And that's a very important word for us, an important word for Jacob because uh, of the context of what it means. The family of 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 Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is now called Israel, um, have been promised the land of Canaan. That's their promised land. That's the land that God has given to them. Uh, but now they have to leave that land and come and, and dwell in, a, in another land that's not their own land. And they know it's not their own land. And, and so it's this very temporary kind of thing. And so for you and I tonight, you know, we can see that correlation right there in our lives. We are sojourning in this life. We're just passing through here. And, and that's the idea of sojourning. Sojourning in the best of the land. But the idea of sojourning is, the meaning here is to turn aside from the road for a lodging as a guest. 
And we looked at that before because Abraham and Isaac, they were sojourning in the land as well. And it gives us that idea. You know, this is not my home. This is not my permanent place. This is a place where I'm going to dwell like I'm getting a hotel room and I'm just a guest here. This is not home. I know there's a, another home that I have. And, and so for a Christian, that's a very important concept for us to nail down in our own lives. Uh, this is not our home. This earth is not our home. You know, we are sojourning. We're traveling through. We're pilgrims is another word that will be used a little bit later tonight. We're pilgrims in this land, but we know that our permanent home is is the heavens that, that God has promised us, the eternity, uh, spending eternity with him in in heaven. And so um, for the Christian, you know, you think about those kind of things. It's like, well, you know, I'm here in this land and we want to make this land our home. We want to make it, it permanent. We want to get a lot of stuff and acquire a lot of things. And for the Christian, it really trips us up. If we don't have this kind of mindset that I'm just here for a, a brief period of time. And those of you that are getting a little bit older, you know that time has passed by very quickly. I know in my own life, just being 45, it seems like, you know, time is just, phew, it's gone. You know, the years have just flown by. I, I remember as a little kid, you know, we had some kids running around here tonight, and, and uh, man, time could just not go fast enough, right? You think, wow, man, is summer ever going to get here? And now we think about it, it's like, man, the years are just flying by. It's crazy how fast they go by. The older you get, the faster they go by. And um, so anyway, we think about these things as a, as a believer, you know, I need to have this mentality that the years of my life are going to go by very quickly. And so what am I doing? Am I establishing my kingdom here on this earth? Or am I looking ahead to that promised land that God has promised me? Am I just thinking about being here in this very short time as a, as a sojourner, as a pilgrim? I'm just passing through. I'm just a guest here. I'm... Uh, you know, a traveler, not of this world, you know, that's the bumper sticker you see now that Christians have, not of this world. I, I have a, another home that is permanent, it's, it's eternal. And so if we think about it in those terms, you know, the things that we have here in this life don't mean as much to us. I mean, there are things that we need. I need a car, I need a job, I need a house, I need clothes, my kids need clothes and those kind of things. Obviously, and it's nice to have some nice things from time to time as well. And I don't think God is telling us we can't do that. But how tightly do we hold on to those things? Um, you know, uh, Geraldine's mom and, and uh, stepfather were over for uh, dinner on Monday night. And their house was broken into. And, you know, they're a fairly wealthy couple that live up in Peregrine, you know, in a really nice house. And, and uh, they've got a lot of cool stuff. But as they're getting older you know, their hearts are, are drawing closer and closer to the Lord. And uh, so somebody broke in, they stole their car, stole a bunch of stuff, you know, and, and kind of fam, family heirloom kind of stuff. And, you know, I was really blessed to hear their response to that. They just said, well, you know, it's just stuff. It's just stuff. It's taken, it's gone. You know, it's a bummer, but oh well, you know. And, and so that's the idea. We are sojourners here in this land. We're lodging here. We, we pulled off the side of the road as we're traveling through and we're going to lodge here for a while in this hotel and then we're going to get back on the road because this is not our permanent home. Well, you see there on the map where Canaan is marked on the, on the right there. Canaan is Israel. If you don't know, you know the, the name gets changed later. After the 400 years of slavery in Egypt, they will have an exodus and, the, and they will go back up to the land of Canaan, which will become the land of Israel. So if you've ever seen those two terms, you wonder, well, where, where's Israel at? Where's Canaan at? It's the same place. So there you go. And so they've come a couple of hundred miles down from Canaan during this famine, the seven-year famine. And now they've come to this fertile Nile Delta that we talked about before, and they're going to dwell in the best of that land. Uh, so they're really going to be taken good care of in the land of Goshen there. Well, you see there that Jacob blesses the, uh, the Pharaoh, which is an interesting concept uh, as well. Uh, you know, it's this idea of the greater blesses the lesser. 
And because as a lesser, you don't have anything to give, you know, is kind of the idea. The, the greater bestows a, a blessing upon the lesser. And, and so we'll get to that in a minute. But also one thing you can look at there at the end of verse 6, he says, Pharaoh says to Jacob, if you know any competent men among them, you know, go ahead and dwell down there in the land of Goshen. You know, your shepherds, that's great. Go, do, go dwell down there. If you know any competent men among them, make them chief herdsmen over my livestock as well, you know. And I, I just see this as, as Pharaoh saying, hey, have you got, any, you got anybody else at home like uh, Joseph here? Because Joseph does a great job taking care of my stuff. And uh, if you got anybody else like him at home, have him take care of my, my livestock as well. I thought that was kind of funny, just that that little phrase there. But Father Jacob, he, he comes in and he sets before the Pharaoh and then he blesses the Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Jacob, how old are you? I don't know how he said that, but that's, that's a pretty uh, interesting question to ask somebody. How old are you anyway? You know, I don't know how he asked it. I, I can never forget my son Jeremiah when he was four or five years old. A, a lady in the church came up to him and said, well, hi there. What's your name, Jeremiah? Well, how old are you, Jeremiah? I'm not old. I'm four. <laughs> He says, I thought that was so funny, just the way he thought of that. I'm not old, I'm young, you know. And so, uh, how old are you? It's interesting, you know, we're as old as we feel, and you, you get a sense here from Jacob that he feels, yeah, I, I'm, I'm feeling pretty old, but I know my life hasn't lasted as long as it should have, is, is kind of the idea. Well, in Hebrews uh, chapter 7, we get this, um, this kind of the first time we see this greater blessing the lesser. And it's taken from Hebrews because Hebrews talks about when Abraham met up with Melchizedek, who was the great high priest, this very mysterious character in the Old Testament. And we went and t- through and talked about that earlier on in Genesis, so I won't spend much time on it. But here in this verse you see, now consider how great this man was, Melchizedek to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those, of, those who are of the sons of Levi, who receive the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people according to the law. That is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. But he whose genealogy is not derived from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises." Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And so that tells you what a great man this Melchizedek is or was or still is because really we we saw that that is really a pre-incarnate picture of Jesus Christ there in the Old Testament. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better or the greater is kind of the idea there. And so, you know, an old man in, in that culture was considered a great man because he has gone through his life and he's lived through a lot of things and and they were given a lot of respect and a lot of reverence. And I think that is such a tragedy in the society that we live in, that old people, you know, just kind of get kicked aside, you know, you're worthless and, and we don't have much for you to do. Let's put you in some building somewhere and have somebody else take care of you. And, and really, instead of seeing them as a very valuable uh, asset, that we can glean wisdom from and, and glean, you know, uh, just a richness of the tradition and heritage that we are inheriting, you know, but we just, well, we, I shouldn't say we, but I mean, society as a whole seems to just say you don't have much to uh, add. You don't have much to offer. And I think that's a real tragedy because they are truly the greater. They are greater because they have a, a greater amount of wisdom than what we have. And, and I guess you could just say wisdom is not, valued very much you know it seems like the younger people are sometimes uh, the more respect they get and I don't know how that got all twisted around but it's absolutely upside down the the greater of our society are the older folks that have so much to to give us in the respect of of wisdom and knowledge and and uh, just a rich tradition so 
truly, he was a great man. Now at this point, he says, Jacob in verse 9 said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my life, or my pilgrimage, are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the years, to the days and the years of the years of the life of my fathers in the land of their pilgrimage. And so he has a sense that, you know, yes, I'm old, but I'm not nearly as old as Abraham got to and as Isaac got to. And so there's an acknowledgement that the lifespan of human beings is going down in a noticeable degree. He's 130 now. He'll live to 147. But he's thinking already at this point, man, I'm old. I feel like I'm going to die now. And, uh, you know, my, few are my days compared to my dad. Compared to his dad, few are my days. And it's a result of the sin. It's a result of the curse that is upon the earth for man's sin. God said, you know, you're not going to live to these great ages anymore. And, and uh, you know, 70 years old is about the most you can expect. And uh, truly, that's born through to this time. But back then, they lived to great ages. And so he begins to talk about this pilgrimage. Again, that word. I'm a pilgrimage. I'm a sojourner. I'm traveling through. And my journey has been a short one, but it's been an evil one. It has been, you know... Uh, There's been a lot of tragedy. There's been a lot of hard times. There's been a lot of pain. There's been a lot of sorrow in my life. And, uh, you know, we talked about Jacob in depth as we followed his life. And we saw that really it wasn't until half his life was over before he came to that place of submission, before he came to that place of brokenness, before he came to that place of wrestling with God and then finally submitting to God. And now his life is governed by God. Uh, and, and what a picture it is for us, you know, when we live our lives in such a way where we're fighting against God, we go through some very difficult times. We go through some very painful and evil things in our lives, the things that we do and the things that we have done to us as a result of us living the, that kind of a lifestyle. We, uh, we just reap the whirlwind of that sinful lifestyle that we've chosen for ourselves. And then when we come to a place of submitting to God, when we come to a place of giving our lives over to God, you know, you think, especially if it's later in life, you know, when you're in your 50s or 60s, then you get to this place of thinking, man, I wasted so many years. So many of my years have just been wasted. I wish I had another 50 years that I could live my life in a way that glorifies the Lord. You know, Jesus said, I will give you life and that more abundantly. And so as a believer, you know, when our lives are submitted to the Lord, He just gives us an abundant life that is just fulfilling and rich. And, uh, you know, those, those years of my life where I was, you know, smoking pot three times a day and, and uh, you know, dropping acid once a month and dr- getting drunk every day, every week, you know. I don't remember any of that stuff. Very few stories I could tell you. The, but I wouldn't tell you. <laughs> but, you know, uh, they weren't rich, fulfilling years. I'll tell you that. They're a blur. They're an absolute blur to me. I don't remember much of it. Um, yeah, there were some fun times, but really, what do they mean in the light of eternity? You know, there there were a few laughs, but sin is only fun for a season. And then sin becomes painful, and it becomes a burden that's on your back and it becomes a bondage that you now can't get out of. And, you know, I can kind of see that in in the life of Jacob here. He said, yeah, few and evil have been the days of my pilgrimage. As I've walked through this land, I've gone through some hard times. And a lot of that was because he was out for himself. He was trying to fulfill the lust of his own flesh. He was trying to be number one. He was, you know, trying to look out for himself and, and get all the best deals for himself, and who cares what what happens or what uh, what does it matter what happens to other people? It doesn't, you know. As long as I'm taken care of, was kind of his philosophy, and he deceived people to that end. And so he looks back upon his life at this point, and he says, "Hey, few and evil have been the days of my pilgrimage." Now. Again, thinking about that term pilgrimage, let's look at Hebrews 11 for just a minute. 
all the way to your, the right of your Bible, almost to the end. Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, and then Hebrews. Chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is known as the Hall of Faith, in which the writer of Hebrews talks about, you know, by faith, Noah did this. By faith, Abraham did this. These guys lived their lives by faith. And and here are the things that happened to them in their lives. And so at the end of that kind of thought, he says in verse 13, these all died in faith. All those patriarchs, all those great champions of the faith, they died in faith, not receiving, having not, uh, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrimage, pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and and he who had received the promises offered up only offered up his only begotten son. And he goes on to talk about that. But the idea there is that, um, you know, they were looking ahead. They didn't receive those promises while they were living. But looking ahead, looking afar off, they were assured that they would inherit those promises. They embraced them, they confessed them, and they confessed that this is not our home. This is not our land. This is not a permanent place this is a temporary place. And, you know, there's a, there's a greater place that we're looking ahead to, a heavenly country, it's called. And some other verses that go on to talk about that. We won't go deep into that. But are we thinking along those terms? I hope we are. You know, I hope we're thinking about the future. I hope we're thinking about, you know, the, the heavenly country that we have still yet to inherit. And when we think on in those terms, we're not thinking so much about this place being our inheritance. And as a result of it, we don't hold on to it as tightly. And that's the way God wants us to be thinking about this earth. It's a temporary place. And indeed, Egypt is a type of the world. It's a type of the, the all the things, things that the world has to offer. We can grab onto those things and hold on to them and say, this is all I've got. Or we can say, no, I'm just a sojourner. I'm a pilgrim here. Just passing through, right? (laughs) All right, well, continuing on from there. uh, In verse 10, so Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Joseph situated his father and his brothers and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, the best of the land, the land of Ramesses there. Pharaoh had commanded Then Joseph provided his father, his brothers, and all his father's household with bread, according to the number of their families. Now there was no bread in all the land, for the famine was very severe, so that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan languished because of the famine. Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan for the grain which they brought. And Joseph uh, brought the money into Pharaoh's hand house. So the money, so when the money was, uh, so when the money failed in the land of Egypt, and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came to Joseph and said, "Give us bread, for why should we die in your presence? For the money has failed." And Joseph said, "Give your livestock." And I will give you bread for your livestock if the money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph and Joseph gave them bread in exchange for their horses, the flocks, the cattle of the herds and for the donkeys. Thus he fed them 
with bread in exchange for all their livestock that year. When that year had ended, they came to him uh, came to him the next year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is gone. My Lord also has our herds of livestock. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may not be desolate. And so you can see the the progression of the famine is getting worse and worse and worse. And as a result, the economy has failed. The money has failed. Nobody has any money anymore. Uh, if they do have any money, it's it's not worth anything. Uh, the only thing that's of any value whatsoever is bread, food. And, um, you know, that's what the Bible talks about is in the end times. It, you know, that bread and oil will just be more valuable than a whole day's wage and and just any amount of food is going to be extremely valuable. People will be starving. There'll be a famine. There'll be, uh, you know, just it'll be a terrible time for people to live. Well, you see that here. Um, but I was thinking about it more in the terms of, you know, as we're looking at this picture of Joseph being a type of Jesus Christ and the brothers of Joseph coming down and and being saved as a result of of Joseph or Jesus revealing himself to his brothers. And you know, we we've looked at the the chronology of this whole story and and certainly we've seen that they sinned against Joseph, they came to repentance. They said were, you know, they confessed their sin and Joseph revealed himself and saved them. And said, come and dwell, and, and I'll take care of you. Now, if you look at that in the terms of our salvation, what comes next, do you think, in, in, the, in the sense of now we're here inside of that salvation? We're now with the Lord. What comes after that? Well, it's growth. You know, before we can bring forth fruit in our lives, though, Jesus, he, God's got to get that junk out of there, Right? And I really see this as, as, a, as a neat picture of sanctification. You know, as we come to the Lord, we got a lot of baggage. We got a lot of things that are pulling us back. We had a lot of things that are holding us back from really being able to serve Him, really being able to glorify Him and bring forth fruit in our lives. And as the world, as its sway is, is less and less upon us, as we realize the world has nothing for me. The world has nothing. I'm a sojourner here and uh, the world is so bad. You know, I just, I don't have any fulfillment. I don't have any joy. I don't have anything that the world is giving me. And so we gradually start giving that stuff up as the Lord puts it upon our hearts to release, you know, those kind of things from our life as he begins to put the finger on the things that we have made a God out of in our own lives, whether it be sports or, you know, pornography or, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, just the love of money, uh, the love of knowledge, the love of, you know, whatever love that takes a precedence over your relationship with the Lord. The Lord begins to put his finger on those things. And one by one, you start giving them away until you finally come to that place of just saying, hey, take me. Just take my whole life. I give my entire self over to you. I know in my own life, you know, I gave my life to the Lord uh, at a very young age, I think five, six, seven years old. I think I was seven. Uh, But there was absolutely no fruit in my life whatsoever to say that I was a believer, uh, you know, at all. I don't see any. You know, my mom would tell you, oh, yes, I knew you were saved, you know, those kind of things. Uh, But she's a mom. She has to say that, you know. Uh, But I certainly... Looking back upon my life, I don't see a whole lot of fruit of holiness or any kind of things like that until I came to a place of brokenness and and saying, Lord, just take my life. You know, just take me, take all of me. I'll give all this stuff up to you uh, just to have that closer walk with you. And, and, you know, I'm still going through that process as you are, I'm sure. But, 
you know, gradually, it's, it's, a, it's a thing where we're just gradually giving Him more and more of ourselves, those things that mean a lot to us. And I see that here as they have come down now, as they have seen who Joseph really truly is, and they have fallen before Him and accepted Him in that way and after they've confessed their sins. Now they come down to take part of that salvation experience and they have to give up everything as a result of doing that. And so at first it's the money, first, you know, and then the money fails, the livestock is next, and then, hey, we don't have anything else to give you. We won't hide from my Lord, you know, and I, I think that is a key verse right there. We won't hide from you. The fact that, you know, here's where I am. I'm broke. I got nothing. I just give myself to you. And how important is that? That we don't hide from the Lord. Because truly, He knows everything that's going on in our lives. Uh, But we still try to hide, you know, just like Adam did in the Garden of Eden. You know, once he realized he was naked, after he had sinned, he realized he was naked and they sewed fig leaves on themselves and they went and they hid from the Lord. And uh, God comes walking through the garden. He says, Adam, where are you? Well, he knows exactly where he is. He's hiding in rebellion and, uh, you know, just trying to get away from the Lord because he's ashamed of where he's at. Now, you and I can hide from God. We can hide from our sin and, and pretend that we're right with him. We can pretend that everything's okay and there really aren't big elephants in our room all over the place, you know, that God sees. Or we can just confess it. Lord, I won't hide from you. Man, this is an area of my life that's an absolute wreck. This is an area of my life that's an absolute wreck. Lord, I won't hide that from you. You know, just take it. Take it and get it out. I'll sell myself to you, he says there in verse 19. Buy us and our land for bread, and we and our land will be servants of Pharaoh. Give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land may be not desolate. So I see that as a tremendous picture of that. And, uh, you know, I shared with you guys a couple months ago that the Lord was really putting this one song on my heart. You know, He won't relent. He won't relent until He has it all. And, uh, you know, from time to time, in fact, if you go on our our YouTube uh, site where all of our teachings are, that's the song that plays as soon as you upload that page. You won't relent until you have it all. And it, it's really what I see here in these verses. You know, God wants all of us. He wants us to come to that place of saying, here, just take it all. It's not worth anything to me. And then once we do that, once we do that, we realize that it was all His to begin with, you know, and he's going to bless us in return and save us and bring forth fruit in our lives. And that's what, exactly what you see in these next couple of verses. But first, we have to look at Colossians 3. Because that really speaks to that notion. Colossians 3, we'll just start there at verse 1. It says there, if then you were raised with Christ, the idea of being born again, you died, you were born again. If you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is. Sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above and not on the things, not on things on the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is exactly what we've been talking about, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. And so put those things aside. Think about if you're, if you're truly raised from the dead in a sense of being born again in Christ. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Think about those things that 
that Christ wants you to be thinking about and live your life in accordance with those things and bring forth that good fruit that God wants to see in your life. And so we see that in the next couple of verses there. He says, you know, hey, just buy, buy us and, and then give us seed that we may live and not die. And then he says in verse 20, then Joseph brought, Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For every man of the Egyptians sold his field because the famine was severe upon them. So the land became Pharaoh's. And as for the people, he moved them into the cities from one end of the borders of Egypt to the other end. Only the land of the priests he did not buy, for the priests had rations allotted to them by Pharaoh. And they ate their rations which Pharaoh gave them. Therefore they did not sell their lands. Then Joseph said to the people, Indeed, I have bought you and your land this day for Pharaoh. Look, here is seed for you, and you shall sow the land. And it shall come to pass in the harvest that you shall give one-fifth to Pharaoh. Four-fifths shall be your own as seed for the field and for your food and for those of your households as food for your little ones. Uh, So they said, You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. So it's kind of weird to think of Pharaoh as being God. (laughs) But, you know, if you look at the the typology here, I mean, that's kind of where he's at. I mean, he's, he's the instrument that, you know, God uses to save them, obviously. But um, if you look at it in that sense, you know, they're not upset about this. He takes all their lands and everything and takes their money and their livestock and everything and buys them and now they're slaves to him. And later on, it will, be kind of, it will become a bad thing as they do become true slaves as a new Pharaoh arises and uh, treats them very badly indeed. Uh, but in this sense, you know, at this point in the story that we see here, he's just provided salvation for all of them. And they're very happy about that. You have saved our lives. Let us find favor in your sight now. And so he brings them to a place of being able to give them the seed so they can go out and plant for themselves and harvest their own fields again, which they did not have. They had to give up everything. But he gives them a little bit of land, gives them the seed, and he says, hey, go out and be fruitful. Go out and be fruitful. And... Uh, I thought that was just a great picture of what the Lord does in our hearts as well. Jesus says in Luke 18, 22, you still lack one thing. Who's he talking to there? The rich young ruler that came to him and said, you know, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus tells him, well, you know, keep the Ten Commandments. Well, which ones? You know, and he rambles off the ones that have to deal with your relationship with man. And uh, he says, well, I've already kept all those from my youth. I've been keeping the Ten Commandments those ones that you just talked about, from my youth. And so Jesus, realizing that this guy, you know, he he knows exactly what the the God is in this guy's life. It's the money. And so Jesus says to him there, you still lack one thing. Sell all that you have and distribute it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. And so the guy is sad. When he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. This guy was very rich, and that was his God. I can't give up that God to follow Jesus. I can't give up that God uh, my money, because that's the thing that means the most to me. So, you know, he's not a pilgrim. He's somebody that says, this is my land. This is my stuff. This is my money. And it means more to me than anything else. I won't go follow after Jesus, even though I think he is a good guy. He's a good moral guy. Um, But evidently he didn't see Jesus as being God in the flesh, as we know him to be. And so he says the money is more important than following after Jesus. And that's very tragic. And that's the mindset that you get into when this is your home when you're not a sojourner here when you're not a pilgrim here but when you're uh, you know holding on to those things too tightly 
Well, the last point I think I have here for you, you belong to God. And uh, I, I see that there where he says, you know, I have bought you. Joseph said to the people, verse 23, indeed, I have bought you in your land for Pharaoh. And certainly he has bought us as well. 1 Corinthians 6.19 Talking to the Corinthian church about their sexual immorality. Uh, they were a very sexually immoral church. And so right before this verse, he tells them, flee from those things. Flee from sexual immorality. You know, you can't join yourself uh, in, a, in, a, in that sexual way because you are a part of God. You know, you're one with God. And he says here to them, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you have from God and you are not your own. And then he goes on to say that very famous line. For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God now. You have died that death of you know, dying to yourself. You put that old man, that old woman in the grave and you rose again in newness of life, as a new believer, as a born-again believer. You were able to do that because Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. He paid the price for your sins that you could not pay for yourself. And as a result, He ransomed you. He paid for your life. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. Everyone has to pay a price for their sins. But Jesus said, I'll pay your price. You can't pay your price, but I'll pay it for you in my death. And so when we take part in that, and take part of that salvation, He buys us, He ransoms us, is kind of the the theological idea there. And so uh, you are bought at a price. You're not your own. And so what's the result of that? What do we do with that knowledge? Well, we take that seed that He's given us, We take that little bit of land that he's given us and we plant it and we bring forth the fruit that he has asked us to bring forth. In in so doing, we glorify him. And you see them glorifying the the Pharaoh here. They said to him, hey, you've saved our lives. You know, let us find favor in your sight. And so they go out and they plant that seed and they keep their families alive as a result of it. Joseph made it a law over the land of Egypt to this day that Pharaoh should have one-fifth except for the land of the priests only, which did not come from Pharaoh's. Now, in verse 27, uh, we see just kind of a last little um, interaction with Joseph and his dad, Jacob. So Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they had possessions there and grew and multiplied exceedingly. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. When the time drew near that Israel must die, he called his son Joseph to him uh, and said to him, Now if I have found favor in your sight, please put your hand under my thigh and deal kindly and truly with me. Please do not bury me in Egypt." But let me lie with my fathers. You shall carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burial place. And he said, I will do as you have said. So this idea of putting your hand under the thigh was a, it's kind of akin to us when we're going to swear an oath, we put our hand on the Bible and raise our hand. It was just kind of how they did it back then. It was kind of an intimate, you know, you feel the warmth there and the flesh and blood there and, and, and so it's not a, you know, a distant kind of an oath that you're taking. It's a very personal one. And, uh, you know, something like shaking a hand or something along those lines. And so he says, you know, don't leave my body down here in Egypt. Uh, let me lie with my fathers. Take my body back up to the land of Canaan, the promised land. I want to be buried in the place where my father and his father and And his father were buried, and and so do that. And so uh, Joseph says, yeah, I'll do that. Verse 31, then he said, swear to me. And he swore to him, so Israel bowed himself at the head of the bed. So we'll get into chapter 48 next week, but um, just in closing tonight, 
again, uh, are you a sojourner here? Are you a pilgrim here? I encourage you, uh, if you live that kind of a life of a sojourner, not holding on too tightly, but just saying, the Lord is the Lord of my life and I'll live my life in such a way that I'm ready to follow him wherever he tells me to go. Uh, You know, I don't think you'll come to the end of your life saying, the days of my pilgrimage have been few and evil. You'll come to the end of your life saying, the days of my life, of my pilgrimage have been rich. They've been abundant. They've been full. They've been fulfilling. And now I'm ready to die and go and be with the Lord for eternity. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these things tonight. Lord, we thank you for the incredible picture that your word paints for us as as salvation and sanctification. And all these concepts that you've placed back in the Old Testament for us to just enjoy as we study and read through. Uh, Father, we just ask that you would just help us to meditate upon these things. Lord, that we wouldn't forget what we've heard here tonight. But Lord, we'd just uh, have a a life of um, abundance as we don't hang on too tightly to this world, but we hang on tightly to you instead and look forward to that time that we will spend with you in eternity. Lord, as we sojourn for the rest of this week on our pilgrimage here on this earth, Lord, would you be glorified in our lives Would you be exalted and may we bring forth good fruit as a result of us submitting our lives to you in that way. We praise you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.